Welcome in, welcome in, everybody. Noon in the middle of off season, but with spring football happening, nuggets happening, getting coaches at the podium on a regular basis. What is this fall camp? It's amazing. I love it. I love that we're having program access this time of year. It's something we haven't gotten before. And it's something that as a fan gets me even more excited than I already am. And if you guys are like me, and I know you are if you're here in the middle of the offseason watching this video, you're obsessed with this stuff. And the more they can feed that obsession, the happier we are, the better we feel. So guys, welcome in. I wanted to talk about changes. Changes to this program, and now we can kind of look back in retrospect. That's a weird word to use only a few months into a tenure of a coach, retrospect. But we can look back on things that we've noticed that are different, that feel different, that, that, that are literally different than before, and think about them and maybe project forward things that we hope will be different Saturdays in the fall. And, of course, we want to win. We want to win more than five or seven games. So any change right now feels really good and significant. Before I get into that kind of stuff, I feel like I always have to drop the caveat of nothing really matters until you win. These changes are fun to talk about. It helps us pass time. It helps, it helps us contextualize what we're seeing as a new football program. It's fun. We enjoy it. But nothing really matters until you go out there and you win. So let's keep that in mind while we go through some things here. I have a list of changes I want to go through that we've noticed so far, some more recent, some already kind of we've that we've been sitting on for a while like the portal for instance elko uses the portal and i know we're kind of on the ground floor of that thing but to see elko play ball with it compared to the last year i guess you could say there were some holes on the team that we wish maybe were addressed in the transfer portal last year and of course going into this off season you needed to use the portal but elko went above and beyond with it didn't he so that's a nice change to see someone playing ball in the current landscape the modern landscape of college football Things like that are things I want to highlight. And, of course, there are a couple of juicy ones that we've gotten as soon as – as recently as this week from um, Jay Bateman and DJ Hicks and the crew that have been getting the podium visits. It's really, it's really been awesome. But first, let's say what's up to everybody in the chat. I see a few of you guys in here, some regulars, some people I haven't seen in a while. Jeb can't make it in tonight, but he always drops a chat. Good to see you, Jeb. He's out in Austin with the boys. Stay safe out there. Have a good time in Austin. Not my favorite place in the world. I like the idea of Austin. It's a little crowded. It's a little built on top of itself. It's a little overpopulated. Not really my thing. I guess I'm I guess I'm weird, but you enjoy yourself, Jeb. Matt Myers in here, good to see you. Rolly, good to see you, Rolly. What's up, Drew and gang? Hope y'all are good. We're good, man. We're good. Good to see you. Ronnie Barker in here. Teresa B, what's going on, Drew? Not much. Not much, Teresa. Good to see you in here. Had a busy week. So I apologize for not putting any videos out this week, but I'll be back with some regular videos next week. But we couldn't, we couldn't miss the live show this week. Rolly, you like the tune? A little metallic, a little Nirvana to kick things off. we got to start. we got to get the juices flowing before we start these shows. That's just how it has to go. Gary, good to see you again. I've seen you in the comments, but it's good to see you in the live show again. Glad to be joining the group. Last couple of weeks have been crazy. I know how it goes, man. Life, life just gets crazy sometimes. It's just how it is. Anxious to see what kind of damage the ass can lay on South Carolina. Yes. And I'll just talk briefly about the Tuesday game this week. I predicted that it would be a loss. I thought we were due for like a midweek off game. Things have been cruising so well. I mean, it, it, we were in the thick of conference play now. We have the, 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 the weekend series versus South Carolina coming up, the big rivalry. But no, they took care of business. They focused up, and then when was it 12-1? to 1? Just a beautiful game. Montgomery's just on an absolute heater right now. It's insane to watch him. I think he's moved up to like fourth in some mock drafts now yeah Braden Montgomery's making some money he's amazing to watch noble guy good to see you noble I haven't seen you in a while I'm glad you're here man how you been noble am I wearing true classic yes this is true classic it's a great shirt for big guys tied up top loose on the bottom I just you know it makes you feel yourself when you wear a two classic a true classic it's a nice shirt thanks for noticing that you think ags are gonna take it I believe I believe so much lawsuit drama oh no Plus the must bus, so much to discuss. I can't wait to get you on, Max. Montgomery and Grohovic are now on an absolute tear right now. If Jace can get back in stride, I don't see why we can't sweep. Yeah, Jace had an off game. He's been off, but that's okay. We know what he can do. Yeah, they can do it. They can definitely do it. 
the 12 round heavyweight NIT championship game. It just ended. I wasn't even watching it, but maybe you can update us. John Peroni, good to see you. You're killing it on Twitter. Keep up the Aggie love. Hey, I'm just trying to spread the Aggie word, man. That's my only goal here. Bring more Aggies together. The Cactus Jack. Someone has to fill me in on the whole Cactus Jack thing. I just kind of got caught wind of it today. I know the gear is expensive. I, someone needs to fill me in. Someone needs to fill me in. Lash is back. Good to see you, Lash. Good to see you. You take everything back about Buzz. So you're on the Buzz train now. Yes, man. You got to keep Buzz around. Buzz, give him some time. Things are getting better and better. Feels like the, there's a buzz in the program. That was a pun I accidentally threw out in the last video I did about Buzz Williams. But, yes, things feel good. True, true, com true Classic is so comfy, carefree, great feeling shirt. Not even sponsored by them. True Classic and Roback. If they wanted to sponsor me, I, those are – I mean, yes, those are the best shirts. I don't even need a sponsorship to wear them on stream every – y'all saw me during the regular season. I wore a, a, the A&M Roback like every other video. It's just – it's my attire, man. All right. I'm going to talk some football, guys. I know baseball's hot right now, but I got to talk football, guys. I was talking about changes, things that feel different. And before I get into my list of changes that I like so far, I want you guys in the chat to tell me about any changes that you've noticed that you like so far in this new program. Obviously, there's a lot of new. There's a lot of different with a whole new coaching staff. It's a different era of Aggie football. But what are some specific things that have you excited or hopeful for the future or maybe things that you want to see different in the fall. We've gotten a lot of stuff so far. And some of these things we've talked about, but some things are new. I want to start with something that we've mentioned briefly on this show. We have a named starting quarterback in spring. And I don't think that's something that we can say was the case since 2020 Kellen Mond. And maybe it's circumstance. You have Connor Wigman coming back healthy. He was the starter last year. He went down. He got hurt. And there's no, there's no fuss about it. I know some people were mentioning maybe Jalen Henderson needs a shot. Maybe Marcel Reed needs a look. But no, they out and announced that Connor Wigman is quarterback one going into spring. We know this. We talked about this. Over the last couple of years, I felt like we had a clear front runner at quarterback, but the previous staff was reluctant to name the guy. I get that competition breeds results. I get that it makes you sharper. It makes you better. But I really like, at quarterback in particular, naming your starter. So right now, Connor Wigman is getting exclusive reps with the ones. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He's getting the reps. He's getting the practice. He's building the chemistry. And at the quarterback position, that is the name of the game right there. You've got to build timing. You've got to learn tendencies. You've got to learn your receiver's ranges. You have to learn so much. So much of that is feel. And we've heard coaches talk about how Connor Wigman has great feel for the game, but he's sharpening that tool as quarterback one through spring. Amplified importance from the fact that it's a new staff, it's a new playbook, it's a new system. So that's great. The last few years were weird because I always felt like when, um, when we had quarterback battles that there was a starter that we, we would imagine would have been the starter, but they wouldn't just out and name him. They would keep flipping the, the, the ones. It would be, uh, one guy's the one today, one guy's the one the next day. I like having the one consistent guy at this position group, but keep competition across the field besides there. I think it's a benefit, and I like the change. Talked about us hitting the portal hard. I like that we have a no-nonsense, low-maintenance, low-baggage coaching staff. And I don't think any coach under Jimbo's staff did anything detrimental to the team, at least from what we could tell outside looking in. But it was really off-putting that the main storylines, at least from a national perspective, going into the year last year was, is this a volatile coaching room? When is Jimbo going to snatch the offense away from Bobby Petrino? With this staff, you feel like you got a bunch of, and it's the, it's the buzzword, a bunch of football guys, a bunch of down-to-earth guys, a bunch of just ball coaches that want to come here and get to work. And I don't, I'm not going to speak ill of the previous staff, but from a fan perspective, it's nice to have this businessman-like approach from your staff. And from what we've heard from these guys, they're all great. So I really like that aspect. There's no none of the, the Durkin scandal before, the Adazio stuff, obviously Bobby Petrino and then Jimbo himself. This is a down-to-basic staff, fundamental, a fundamental, discipline-oriented staff. And I really love to see that. So that's a big change that I'm, I'm happy about. 
Another change that I mentioned, I alluded to earlier, and this is going to lead me down a couple of tangents, so bear with me. They're all changes, and they're all good. I love that the coordinators are getting weekly podium visits. Under Jimbo, and this is a philosophy a lot of very successful coaches, so you can't really knock it, even though it was frustrating to me. It was like Fort Knox. You couldn't get any straight information about this team, hear from coaches. You barely got any practice glimpses. During the pulse, you would get some, but aside from that, you didn't get that kind of thing. Well, we are getting weekly visits from Colin Klein, Jay Bateman. They're telling us about the team, the progress. Obviously, there's not so much that they can divulge with only like a seven practice sample size. But it's great to hear these coaches' mindsets. It's great to hear from others than just Elko, who we're going to hear from in a lot of different cases throughout the year, multiple times a week. I mean, the head coach is obviously the spokesman for the team. But I love that we are getting this insight, at least from fans. And this last week, we also had Connor Wigman, DJ Hicks, really briefly on that. I think it's very telling that DJ Hicks got one of the first podium trips of the Elko era. I mean, I think we had all anticipated that DJ Hicks was going to take that next step. But I think the fact that he's already being looked at as a leader, and to me, these early podium visits, they usually put the leaders up there, the spokesmen for the team up there to talk to the media. The guys they can trust to talk to the media are allowed to talk to the media. I think it's a really cool sign to see DJ Hicks up there. But he also divulged some information that I think Aggies should be very excited about. He has asked what were some of the changes of the defense compared to the previous regime, and he said that they were going to lean more on the D-line, and they're running pretty much only four-man front. So here's my next tangent. And Jay Bateman in his presser also mentioned the four-man, not the four-man front. He mentioned they're going to lean on this D-line. He, he said the D-line is going to be one of the strengths of the team. So it's great to hear that confidence early on. I have said that one of my questions on the team going forward is depth at defensive tackle. Someone singled out Rodas Johnson as someone who's flashing. I think it was DJ Hicks himself. But the four-man front versus three-man front thing. And over the last two years under Dirk, and we got a lot of three-man front, to the chagrin of many Aggies, including myself at times, I think the three-man front is an okay tactic to utilize in football. I think it confuses defenses. I think it's not what defenses are used to seeing. I think you can move a stand-up uh, hybrid linebacker defensive end guy around, confuse RPOs. You can drop that guy back into coverage. But with A&M in particular, this is a team that not only historically, but very, very much recently, like significantly over the last few years, is built from the D-line out. Well, we're talking about the defensive side of the ball. We don't have to, I don't have to tell you who a and has had at defensive line over the last few years. Obviously, it's a blue-chip talent-ridden room. It's full of these really, really uber-athletic, uber-promising, unlimited potential kind of guys. And it was a little bit frustrating to see a defense not really lean on that aspect of the team. Whether it was using only three down linemen or standing one up and moving him around, it didn't feel like you were using this defense to its best abilities. I get that you move that one defensive end of guy around, and I get that maybe sometimes they're going to occupy a space rather than get after the ball or, 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 or pursue the ball or, or be aggressive. They're, they're, they're dropping back. But when I see LT Overton drop 15 yards back into coverage, Malik Silla drop 10 yards back into coverage, that makes me scratch my head a little bit. I feel like you're not utilizing your team to its best abilities. Jay Bateman and DJ Hicks both confirmed that we would be doing that. So, yeah, that is a welcome change in Aggieland. Goodbye three-man front. Hello to a, a four-man front base defense. I don't know much else about what this defense is going to look like exactly, but if this is a defense that's going to lean on that defensive line that is still very talented to this day despite the exits we've had, I think we're looking at a better defense overall going forward. So it's great to see these pressers and the little bits of information like this that we get from them. It's not something that we were getting before. It's nice to have. And yeah, I, I, get, I get why guys like Jimbo, Saban, Kirby Smart, these guys are very, very tight-lipped about their program. I get why you do it. But I think you can still have these guys speak without divulging too much information. It's very good from a fan perspective. A couple more smaller changes I won't go on huge tangents with. 
I like the emphasis on discipline and accountability. There are consequences for actions in life and in football. Losing feels really bad, and the punishment is that feeling that you get. You should be punished for not being where you are when you're supposed to be there. And that is a line that Elko has actually used in interviews recently. We've heard from players saying, you don't want to go visit Mike Elko. Discipline, I, I don't know if it was a major flaw of the staff before, but I think as time has gone on, we have heard of instances where things were kind of sweeped under the rug, swept under the rug. They would let things slide here or there. Trey Zoon in last week's press conference has kind of slipped up and said things were kind of sliding last year before he corrected himself right after that statement. Maybe kind of feels like that. Heard a little bit about clicks, so maybe some uh, some some of the more talented uh, five-star athletes getting a little bit maybe better treatment. I don't think that's the case at all anymore, and I think discipline is an absolute emphasis on this staff. I like that they're building from fundamentals and discipline, and we've heard time and time again about how guys are getting punished for not doing what they're supposed to or punished for losing drills and rewarded for winning drills as early as in spring as in early as in winter workouts. So I think that stuff is all awesome. I think it builds the mindset of this team going forward. Really like that that's an emphasis of the staff. Wasn't a disaster before, but I think it's going to be improved now. And the last one, and this is kind of a minor thing as a fan that I I really really appreciate. Don't you guys love what we're getting from the social media's the social media uh, team from this team from this of of the program? Like we're getting so many glimpses of practice. We're getting mic'd up coaches. We're getting coach interviews. Like every assistant coach that has been hired is getting an interview. It's great to see this transparency as a fan. I'm really enjoying it. So guys, I want to know what changes you appreciate so far and maybe changes you want to see this fall. Offensively, there's a lot to learn still about this offense. I think there's a, there's, there, we know who the players are, at least the skill position guys. I think there's a good chance we're going to see a, a shuffle at the offensive line. We saw TJ Shanahan snapping the ball in practice. We're seeing guys play in different positions on this offensive line. But I think for the most part, we understand who the skill guys are on this offense. The same three running backs were highlighted by Colin Klein that we saw last year. Le'Veon Moss, yes, he's practicing. He's part of the team. Great to see Le'Veon. I think he has a ton of potential and a great future ahead of him. I think he was the most ready to go back last year. Unfortunately, couldn't stay healthy. Raved about Ruben Owens' pass catching ability. His ability to grab balls in contested balls is great. I, I think we need to see more deep shots. I think that's been a thing we've been wanting to see over the last few years. Attack downfield. That's not something we've had. I think we need to feed the studs to use a Bobby Petrino line. I, I think players like Moose Muhammad need to be featured consistently. I think players like Le'Veon Moss need to be featured consistently. I think you need to play through these guys. And I don't know if we did that before. So there's some things I'm hoping to see from this offense going forward. I want to see guys stay healthy. That's a big change that needs to happen. And we think under Tommy Moffat, it's going to change. We feel like we have the best possible training staff, the best possible outlook on the body and the physical aspect of the game that we could have gotten in this coaching acquisition period. I think you have it at A&M now, and I think we're going to see the healthiest and most mentally tough A&M team we've seen in quite a while. So those are some things I want to see. I want to hear from you guys. Now let's see what you guys are saying in the chat. What lawsuit drama? We're going to have to see what Max has to say about the lawsuit drama. He's keeping us current with the latest on that front. Colin Klein said Le'Veon's practicing. Absolutely. Beautiful to see. Beautiful to see, Philip. Good to see you in here, Philip. Many doubted Elko's ability to recruit, but he's blowing that up. Stressing quality over quantity. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk about the latest edition here in just a second. I mean, he already has four commits on the year, Landon Rink being the most recent. It's going well. It's going really well. I really like what Landon brings to the table. We'll talk about him in just a second. What I miss, says Jeb. Good to see Moss practicing. Yes, Moss is practicing. If you missed that, it's a big deal. Good to see you in here, Max. First time you made it live. Awesome, man. Ted Prickett. Good to see you, Ted. What up, people? Gig'em. Hit that like button. Let's get Drew famous so he's hired by Tex. Uh, I don't know if I want to be hired. I, I kind of enjoy doing it this way. I kind of enjoy just talking to you guys without any filters and just making this like a pretty laid back situation. I don't know if I want too much structure to this to this side of my life. But hey. I think we do need to get this blown up so we can bring more Aggies together, though. Which football game should I attend this year? 
It's very pricey coming from Tokyo. Well, the price is an issue. Philip is saying you should go to the TU game. Don't go to the TU game if price is an issue because you're going to pay for for a corner seat, top of the stadium. You're going to pay 600 minimum, and I think that's being pretty generous. I think you're looking more like 700 after fees. Which game should you go to? I think the Missouri game would be a really good, more affordable home game. If A&M and Missouri are undefeated going into it, that might change. I think that's probably your best bet when you're looking at the home games, though, because the opener versus Notre Dame, that's going to be pricey. LSU, that's going to be pricey. Texas, we just talked about it, going to be crazy. Probably looking at Missouri. But if everyone thinks that way, everyone's going to go to that game and the ticket prices are going to go up. It is a great year for Kyle Field. You're going to have amazing games in Aggie Land this year. And that's very – enjoy it because it's going to change in 2025. The schedule flips the next year. So get your good games in this year. Get your affordable games in the next year. What do you think about Elko talking about other sports when he starts his interviews? I loved that. And he talked about the – what was it? Swimming? Diving? I forget what exactly he brought up in his last presser. Yes, I feel like Elko gets a and Look, I don't mean to make this whole video a dog on the previous staff situation. It didn't work out, and we're looking at things in hindsight. If things didn't work out, there were some things wrong, whether it was fit, philosophy, whatever it was. I always kind of felt like Jimbo was just Jimbo. And what I mean by that, I don't ever feel like he fully embraced being part of Aggie land. That's okay. You could have still won with that being the case. This is just another one of those nice changes that we're seeing now. I feel like Elko has embraced it, at least to the extent that he needs to, to at least make us acknowledge it and feel good about it. The way he mentions teams, the way he is present at baseball games and other sporting events, the way he engages with us on social media it feels like he's really embracing the community of Aggieland, embracing the 12th man, and just kind of not having this wall up. There's not as much of a wall between the program and the fan right now, and I think that just increases buy-in, increases belief, increases support. And, of course, the support's always going to be here in Aggieland. That's why it never wavered under Jimbo, but it's at another level now where it's more in the heart. It's He's more beloved right now. I mean, obviously we want to win, but I want Elko to win. I, I, believe, I, I really like the guy. I really like Mike Elko. And I didn't dislike Jimbo, but I feel like I have, uh, I have better feelings here. I'll just put it that way. Ted says he's going to call in about 10 minutes. Awesome, man. Yeah, the call-in link is pinned in the chat, by the way. I didn't mention it. But if you guys want to call in, it's linked right there at the top of chat. So just click that. You'll be prompted to enter a waiting room. Just activate your mic, not your video, and I'll pull you guys in one by one. You're going to enter the waiting room. And that's normal. You're not going to see anything. You're just going to hear me talking, and I'll pull you guys in one by one. Quarterback room is really good, says Rolly. No doubt Wegman is quarterback one. I'm glad they already said it. Henderson, O'Neal, Reed, Longstreet should commit to AM later this month. Yeah, it's a great room. It's a deep room. Ronnie went to the Tennessee game last year. Hey, I was there too, Ronnie. Nealon was crazy, man. It was awesome. I had a good experience with those fans. I had one grumpy fan in front of me. He wasn't interacting with me. I was a row of Aggies. There's a row of Aggies in front of me. And there's a row of volunteers, the, the third row forward. And the guy was just leaning into the Aggies' knees. Like he wanted more space than was actually there to the point where he had a seat back. He was sitting on top of his seat back, leaning back onto the Aggies' knees. That was rough. I wasn't part of that. So I can say my experience with the Tennessee volunteers was pretty good. But I know SEC football guys are serious. I know, I know things can get pretty toxic. So. That's not – if I have a toxic interaction with a fan, I'm not blaming the, that fan base. Besides LSU, I've never had a good one with them. I'm just kidding. I've had one or two. Missouri game is going for 100 a ticket. That's the one I'm going to. That's the, that's the one to go to then. Missouri, Ronnie, go to the Missouri game. I'm trying to go to Notre Dame. I can't go to Texas. I just – I can't swing the money. It's okay. I can't go. And I'm going to try to go to one other home game. Next year, I want to live stream all of the games here with you guys. If you're not going to the game, jump on with Drew. We're going to talk. You're going to see you're going to see me have conniption fits. You're going to see my whole – you guys experience. I'm not unique. I mean, we all feel the, the Aggie football feeling when we're watching a game. Section 350, row 11. I like to watch the games from that angle. Really not a bad seat in the stadium, though. I know. It's, it's great because it's so vertical, right? So you're never really that far back. I feel like it places like – the big house at Michigan, if you get one of the top seats, you're really far from the field and things can get a little small. 
Did you see where Ole Miss hired Jimbo? Was that on April 1st? Because I didn't see that. I saw that uh, Trev Alberts hired Jimbo onto the staff as an April Fool's joke. Yeah, the quarterback room is going to be great. Colin Klein's going to do great things with them. All right, guys. We have Max waiting in the call room. We have Theo going to call in in a minute. And if anybody else wants to call in, call in now. I want to briefly touch on a couple other things before we get into the callers. I think Max is going to want to touch on one of these. Maybe. I think Max is just going to focus on the lawsuits, and we'll let Max go off. Max likes to go off. He, we let him get some steam out on this show sometimes. So Landon Rink, the latest commit for Texas A&M, a beast, a giant man at his age. He's already 280 pounds, 6'2", by all accounts. He's explosive. He's vicious. He's mean. Seems like the kind of guy that can morph into a true SEC nose tackle. I mean, I can't wait to see what comes of his senior year, but I think he had 15 sacks his junior year. So we're talking about a beast of a man. We're talking about Elko keeping things rolling at a really good time, and I really feel like recruiting is going to pick up some momentum in the next couple of months. I'm not an insider, though, so keep an eye on your insiders right now, but we feel really good about some of these grabs that Elko's done so far. People said Elko couldn't recruit. People were doubtful about this, and I had to see it before I, I committed to, oh, Elko's a great recruiter. He's doing pretty damn good right now, and what players say about Elko, it feels like he kind of speaks their language, so I'm very hopeful that this is going to be a very good recruiting class, full first full recruiting class for Elko. And really, this isn't even a full recruiting class because these guys are typically recruited from eighth grade forward, at least the highest level guys are, at least throughout high school. So Elko's just kind of getting the finishing touch touches on the 25 class um, if you guys care at all about this i'm going to tell you what a&m is ranked right now in the composite 247 recruiting rankings i think we're 20 24 right now with five commits 90.7 average and that whatever that means things change a lot ratings change a lot throughout senior year uh, of these players uh high school careers so that's going to change a lot Belco lands another top 10 class well, I'm not, not another, but if he brings A&M another top 10 class, we're going to be feeling so good. Anyway, the next thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to read this to you guys because this is kind of above my pay grade, <laughs> above my head at least. Let's see if I can get the right screen up here. Okay, here we go. Kind of a big thing, and I don't think anything's going to come from this, but let's read it to you guys, and I'll tell you what I think. College football super league to replace NCAA, college football playoff being discussed by school presidents. Now, don't, don't get too excited. I don't think anything here is actually going to happen anytime soon. I don't think this is the thing that's going to change college football. But it's interesting, so I'm going to read it to you guys. A group that includes several college presidents has proposed to dramatically alter the way college football is organized, according to the Athletics' Andrew Marchand and Stuart Mandel. The group, which is called College Sports Tomorrow, has floated the idea of creating a two-tiered structure amongst uh, FBS schools. The current CST outline would create a system that would have the top 70 programs, all members of the five former major conferences, plus Notre Dame and new ACC member SMU as permanent members and encompasses all 130 plus FBS universities. The perpetual members would be in seven 10 team divisions joined by an eighth division of teams that would be promoted from the second tier. So I'll stop there. So this is major restructure to college football we're talking about here. And it's something that I think eventually needs to happen. I think eventually we're going to have to look at building this into a structure that makes a little bit more sense. To me, what doesn't make sense about the sport right now is you have about 135 teams where realistically on a given year, not even going to say on a given year, realistically in general, only about 70 or so are eligible to actually win the championship. If you have a bottom tier FBS school go undefeated, a bottom tier G5 school go undefeated, even if in today's day and age they make it to the college football playoff, I don't know how realistic it is that they're going to run the table and win that thing. Especially before in the BCS era, I mean, maybe you had 50 teams realistically that could win it all. So to me, there's just too many teams in college football, and I know we love our match, and I know we love our Tuesday night football, and that would never go away, and I would still watch that because I love that. I just love midweek college football. I think we need some more structure, and I think a central entity is the way to go. Now, I don't think this proposed organization or group or change is going to be the thing that changes college football. I, this is the first wave. This is 
Ooh, what's an analogy here? Okay, this is morbid, but I'm going to go for it. Should I go for it? Yeah, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Giving birth. You got contractions. And then eventually you have a baby. I can't believe it. The contractions kind of start far apart. And as you go through these contractions, you get closer to birth. The baby gets closer to coming out. And eventually, several contractions down the road, you have the baby. The baby in this case being whatever college football eventually becomes. But you got to have those contractions to get there. And they're going to get more intense and more close together as things go along. So this is the first what I think will be many attacks, proposals, attempts of changing what is college football. But guys, don't get too excited. I think we're pretty far from anything like this happening. I think we're going to look at some more Wild West for 10 years or so before we can get close to anything like this. A relegation type system is very interesting. That way, all the bottom feeders actually have a chance of making it into the, the, the dance. If you're playing well, if your program is cruising, if you're on the rise, you have a chance. I like that. And I like that our Power 5 teams will remain in the forefront of college football with this proposed idea. It makes a lot of sense to me. As, as a fan who's not you know in the meeting rooms, making the decisions, shaking the hands, having the conversations, this makes a lot of sense. It sounds like a lot of fun to me. Now, I know there are probably some programs that aren't into an idea like this, but I think it's just we need regiment. We need structure. Farther in that article, it talks about how the same governing body would also be in charge of NIL, portal, everything. We need that. We need some kind of central entity in college football. So maybe Max will talk more about that because he knows more about that stuff than I do. Let's check up on the chat one more time, then we'll get into some of the calls. That's a great idea about streaming games. I would tune in. Yeah, I really want to do it. I'm looking forward to it. I'm also going to stream some NCAA football after spring. I'm really looking forward to that too. It's baseball season, baby. Good to see you, OC Airsoft, in here. Yes, it is. Aggie baseball is cruising and Astros are not. Ten team league sounds cool. I just hope we would wind up in a fun league. I'm sure we would based on region. I think our region we it would include. I think it'd be Southwest Conference ish. We would kind of be looking at something like that. Maybe add OU, Oklahoma State in there, Arkansas. It, it'd be fun. I mean, I enjoy the SEC. I, I don't. I mean, it's fun right now. But if that was the the, the thing, the, if that's how it was going to change in the future, I mean, yeah, I'm not. I'm not opposed to a Southwest Conference style of conference. Absolutely an expert on this subject. Are you an expert? Call in. Blue chip ratio says there's only 15 teams with a chance to win a championship. Yeah, that's very true based on the blue chip ratio. And it's not the end all be all, but I don't think that's ever been proven wrong. So yeah, very good point. That's a Josh Pate level of comparison analogy. Look, I don't even know if Josh Pate would go that far. I just compared birth to football. Restructuring is coming, but I don't see 70 tier one teams. Preseason, three games and a bye week on schedule. Every game after is pending on the games you're winning. Kind of like basketball and baseball. You play some poop. You play some dogs. You travel cross country for trips. Wait, let me, let me try to wrap my mind around this one more time. Preseason, three games. So these games don't count. Oh, you're saying, okay, you have a schedule. You have a preseason. You have a bye week. I don't know about a three-season pregame. But I like a, pre a three-game preseason, but I like a preseason. That's a decent idea. Every game after is pending on games you're winning. I don't – do you mean after the schedule? Kind of like basketball and baseball. Yeah, it's not too bad. You're saying a bigger playoff with a preseason and a bye? I want two buys. We have two buys this year. I want to keep that around. You play some poop, you play some dogs. I don't know what that means, but I think I agree. Tra travel cross-country road trip. Yeah, yeah. There are only four teams with realistic chances at the Natty. Who are they? Call in and tell me. All right, guys. Let's get into the callers. Max, you're on with Drew. How you doing, buddy? And what's going on with that lawsuit? All right. So well, the Florida State lawsuit had a, a hearing a couple weeks ago, and the decision came down from the courts today. So we have we have news. Okay. Uh, the North in North Carolina, the judge ruled that one of the ACC's counts that they sued Florida State on, which was fiduciary responsibility, was dismissed. However, everything else that Florida State wanted dismissed was not dismissed, and the lawsuit was not stayed, meaning that the lawsuit in North Carolina that the ACC filed against Florida State will go forward. 
that that's that's what we got right now and then there's a lot of there's a lot of like details and finer points of like here's what the judge thinks about this point and that point but generally the fact of the matter is the case is going forward and okay. the 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 this judge only struck down one of the counts that the acc C filed against florida state which was not one of their stronger counts they they knew that they were there was not a great chance that that one would stick past the initial stages so okay so remind me and the chat the the context of this lawsuit and the potential implications of the lawsuit so florida state had set up a board meeting and due to their sunshine laws uh they had to reveal this board meeting to the public and so the they knew the ACC knew that this board meeting was about some sort of legal authorization because they have to give some sort of context for what this meeting is about. This uh, Florida State does, mm -hmm. and so ACC got the jump on them and filed a, a a lawsuit in Charlotte in Mecklenburg County the day the day of the meeting basically, and they. After they had it filed, they had a process server show up in Tallahassee right out as they walked out of the board meeting, handing them the lawsuit papers, literally serving them the papers for the lawsuit. Yeah. And that was incredible, right. by the way. Um, and so, and then the Florida State filed their lawsuit in Leon County the next day. So that has a hearing coming up on Tuesday. And considering how Florida law gives preference to who filed first and considering the ruling in, in North Carolina and the facts of the case, which are that the ACC is headquartered in North Carolina, the contracts were signed in North Carolina, four of the schools are in North Carolina, the ACC uh, gets tax benefits from North Carolina, which Florida State is a member of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of facts that would be very hard for the Florida judge to ignore to not move the lawsuit all into North Carolina. Uh, so that there's not two, there can't be two lawsuits going on at once. Uh, so if the Florida lawsuit, if the judge of Florida were to rule that the lawsuit would move forward, there would be some sort of dispute in the federal court that would get it sorted out at some point, most likely um, from my understanding, but I'm not a lawyer. So don't, <laughs> don't take everything at, at complete, for my don't take my word for it completely but that's my general understanding having read from people who are lawyers on this subject all right max i want you to respond to this guy in the comment very simple comment i just want you to rebut in, a, in as respectful or disrespectful a manner as you choose he says the acc sucks well that's just like your opinion man <laughs> <laughs> like okay and and bit and uh and uh, God, I keep, I keep, I forgot his last name. How much Greg Sankey sucks. Okay. So yeah. what? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. look, like, I wanna, I'm going to change subjects real quick on you, Max. I think SMU has a hell of a future ahead of it right now. I'm going to give you some credit real quick. Just there's some money behind SMU. Isn't there? There's a little bit of money behind the pony. Is that right? I mean, y'all got, y'all got some money in the program. You don't say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the move to the ACC, you're getting mentioned in the restructure, Notre Dame and SMU in this whole restructure theory. I mean, whatever that means, I think SMU is well, going. I, we're reading, we're getting mentioned because where there's like the whole, and we again get the full CFP share revenue BS so that they're, they're making sure that we're included in that, even though we're not a full CFP revenue power, autonomous revenue share, whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're being mentioned, um, ah. and it's the same reason uh, Oregon State and Washington State are also being mentioned. I believe yeah. they were also because they said all Power Five, not just the Power Four. Right, 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 right. Okay, so in your eyes, I mean, I'm going to get this oh. is kind of shifting shifting gears here, but where does the ACC fall in future restructure? Where would you like to see the ACC fall? I mean, there's a chance it starts falling apart with. You know, Florida State winning out, Clemson lawsuit. Where, what do you think happens with the ACC? What do you want to happen with the ACC? Oh, I can't hear. Are you here? I only see myself. I don't see you. Can you? Oh. I can't hear you. Oh, no. Uh, 
we lost Max or we lost me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I see you guys can hear me. Let me reset the stream yard. Maybe that'll fix it. All right, Max, you with? Oh, Max, you jumped out. Just jump back in. You'll be back in the chat. I know he was about to cook. Matt says ACC sucks. Lash says the ACC doesn't suck. It swallows. Thank you, Lash. ACC doesn't suck. It's mid. So either the ACC sucks, the ACC swallows, or it's just mid. Noble, I think you're the voice of reason here by saying it's mid. Yeah, I don't want to see the ACC fall apart. I think I've mentioned this before. I, I like a world where the ACC grows, gains Notre Dame, and is one of the power conferences, and we're not relegated to the power two. All right, Max, you back with me? Yeah, sorry. I don't know what that was. I'm sorry. No, I don't know. I don't know where we left off. I was just at. Oh, that's right. I got cut off. I just wanted to, to know what you would want to see the ACC do in the future of college football. I know there's a chance you lose some major teams, and that could be the end of the conference. But I want to see the ACC grow and thrive. What do you think will happen? What do you want to happen with the conference? I've already assumed from the moment that SMU got in the conference that Florida State, Clemson, North Carolina are headed out the door. Okay, that, so you that, accepted that. I, 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 that was, in my opinion, that is the premise of yeah. why SMU got in the conference. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that it's happening tomorrow, first right. off. And second off, just because though I think all those teams are heading out the door – doesn't mean that I might be, I could be wrong. I think there's a possibility where one or two of them end up failing to get out right. anytime soon. And maybe they're stuck till 2036 because maybe they can't raise the money or whatever. So, and who knows what happens between now and 2036. So yeah, right. there, there's too much uncertainty, but what I do think is that in the event, the ACC loses all three teams is that they need to embrace they need to embrace the fact that they've become national and not like be like, Oh, we're going to go get Memphis and Tulane or yeah. Memphis and USF. Like I am, I have zero interest in adding more American conference teams to this league. You already added Louisville and now you added us. Yeah. Okay. Right. You don't need any more. USF is, has been a, a, a comically run uh, athletic department for the past decade. You right. don't need to be involved with that, that Joe. And I don't know if you've noticed, but Memphis is kind of a joke too right now. They just yeah. extended Ryan Silverfield. That man has no defense. Okay. He has no business being extended and being expected to win championships in this conference. Despite the fact that that football conference is terrible yeah. But Ryan Silverfield is that bad of a coach. They are not winning a title because Jeff Trailer, who has way less money than he does, is going to somehow whip him over and over again until Arkansas finally decides that they have to hire Jeff Trailer. Right. You know. Hey. But that's that's another story, man. Speaking of Arkansas, I think the Arkansas basketball coach is heading to USC. Yeah. Yeah, I told you, didn't I? I told yeah. you last week yeah. that it was gonna it was gonna be that. Yeah. I, I didn't. I'm not that I'm a scoop or anything. I'm just. I'm. I'm very logical. It was. It seemed pretty obvious. Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah. first off, uh, haha, Arkansas, your program is a mess. <laughs> uh, you you talk a lot of smack about how many much resources you have in the SEC, and then you can't even prove to a you can't even keep the faith in a coach who had one bad year and he'll just ditch you for USC who has been a joke of a basketball department until they, until Andy Anfield came in, who, despite the fact that I don't like him was by far the most impressive coach they've had since the seventies. Yeah. And that's saying something. Cause I hate Andy Anfield's guts. <laughs> so, Oh man. And you know, what's funny is that we're going to get a, we're going to get a cascade now. Cause it's going to be like Chris Beard or Jerome Tang. But I think Jerome Tang would be a, not a, not a good enough hire that'd be like oh yeah we're gonna go from missing from a losing season to hiring a coach who's not even fully made it through at kansas state yet yeah. like you gotta hire they gotta hire beard right it feels so obvious right and then from beard and then wade's gonna be next thing you know it's gonna be will wade again we're gonna have will wade at mississippi now right it's just a cascading effect so it's 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 all it's all coming back together. I saw someone make a joke. It's like it's a must bear way in here. We got one out of three already within days I know it. of of Enfield moving. I uh, I will brief. I I didn't get to finish my point on the the Super League stuff. Yeah, go for that. So there are there's one big problem with all the Super League regional back to regionalism stuff, which is simply put there's too much power advantage for the big 10 teams or the sec teams to ever cut loose from those conferences. 
what what could happen maybe is that those the biggest brands cut loose from the smaller teams in those conferences and make their own separate football divisions. But let's be real. There's no reason why if you're Texas A&M, you should sign up to be in an equal revenue share regional split league with 70 other teams with everyone split into regional divisions among 10 teams. But instead you can be king of king of king of the hill or whatever with the S uh, in the SEC. And if you're Michigan, why would you, why would you want to be on an even playing field with like, let's be real. You, you financially, you're on a higher playing field than Notre Dame right now. You don't want to give Notre Dame an even playing field. Right. So there's no incentive for these big conferences to give up power like this. And I think, the more interesting and also on top of that promotion relegation is not something that administrators can realistically agree to because they have to set a budget every year and they're beholden to, you know, various laws and legislation, yada, yada. It's not, it's not a fair expectation for them. So it's very hard for me to see something like that being implemented. Yeah. And to be clear with this whole relegation thing, whatever committee is being formed, whatever group it is, it does not involve the conferences, any commissioners, anything like that. So, yeah, I don't see anybody giving up power or anything like that. But, you know, I'd like to operate in a world where money doesn't rule everything, but that's just not the case. So, yeah, money, money is well, here's the thing is that this would pay a lot of money. But the problem is that they'd have to give up power. So. You can't give up power, right? Right now, you, the SEC and the Big Ten hold all the cards. Yep. They're not about to give that up. What could happen, what I think is possible but probably won't happen because it would require a lot of machinations to ever be pulled off, was if they ever did like a Champions League style thing where they said, okay, you're own, we're going to shorten the regular season. And we're and this is after we've had the twelve team playoff era for like and fourteen team playoff era for like a decade. Yeah. And then we're gonna we're gonna award spots in the postseason the way the Champions League does it in Europe, where it's based off coefficient and past performance in the playoff. Whereas in Champions League they, they award it based on past Champions League performance, you get points. And then they do a five year average. And that's how they award the Premier League gets five spots and the the French league gets four spots now and the Italian league gets four spots, et cetera, et cetera. And you could even break it down to where some spots have to play more games than others. Some get buys, some get more buys than others, et cetera, or some have no buys. And for like, if you had like the group of five spot, if they were to keep it would have to play an extra round than anybody else or, or an extra round than anybody else, except for the lowest ranked power team or whatever. Right. These, these these are options on your menu to where you could realistically maintain the power structure of the conferences while still ensuring that everyone is allowed to be involved and also ensuring that instead of the power structure being determined solely by who earns the most money, allowing it to shift dynamically based on performance so that if, let's say, the ACC ever has a really strong run, and the Big Ten has a down year where, you know, only Ohio State and Michigan are any good and Iowa is a joke or whatever. I'm sorry, Iowa. I don't mean to pick on you. Uh, then, and, you know, all of a sudden the ACC has, like, the best year they've had in 30 years and uh, SMU has somehow finally figured it out and become Pony Express 2.0 and uh, Pitt, has, Pitt has the return of Dan Marino reincarnated or whatever. Take your pick. Uh, they can have the the number of teams represented shift around between the conferences, and that way you could you could have some more excitement, some more change instead of just the same teams getting involved from the same conferences over and over again because it's almost predetermined. And on top of that, it's not it's not like now where it's like oh we're we're trying to give a certain amount of spots to the same conference every year and it's contractually written to where it won't change until the end of this period. That's 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 too deterministic for me. It's boring, right? This is fun. This is exciting. It creates debate. It creates conversation. But I don't think you could ever see it be implemented because it would require some imagination and looking at other sports that realistically college uh, sports infrastructure is just not interested in looking at how soccer does things, for example. Yeah. Yeah. 
I just like my football and a beer, man. That's all I need. No, I mean, it's, I don't know what the hell is going to happen. It all sounds interesting, but I don't know, man. I, it's stuff that it's fun to talk about this time of year, but for me, whatever it ends up being, whatever ends up happening, I'm just going to enjoy football. It doesn't I'm not too worried about what happens with the, not, I mean, I'm worried about it in terms of, obviously, I think I'm worried about what will eventually happen, but I'm not worried about it like, oh, like, yeah what's gonna happen in like five years because i have no clue man yeah i know man it's it's so, who knows where we are especially five years 10 years 15 years down the road this thing could look totally different i'm more, I'm more interested in the legal stuff and the court stuff right yeah. now because that 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 has more day-to-day -day action that's tangible whereas all of this is made up yeah this right. is some these are some people talking to some reporter because and they have there's someone who's interesting enough that they'll bother to report it yeah. But none of these people have actual power to make these changes they're describing actually happen. Right. So it's all strikes, it's all man. talk. It's all talk. It's chit chat, chit chat, chit chat. And so someone who actually has power makes a change. I know. I feel like this feels like a like a creative post. Like this feels like some sort of social media post that's just like made it to the next level, or someone just bullshitting, talking about you know what I see for football. This is what it's gonna be. I, that's what it feels like that just made it to the next level of, I guess, newsworthiness. But I don't know what the hell happens. We'll find out, but I know what we have next year. I think there was one more comment I wanted to get from you before we get you out of here for the day. Okay, so where do you think Clemson and FSU end up ultimately? It sounds like I and Big Ten or SEC obviously are the two players here. What do you foresee happening? These guys are saying SEC in 2025. I don't know. I, I, I don't want to put a year on it Yeah. right now. Uh, I definitely would not put a year on it because I think the ACC is going to win these court cases. Yeah. So then it's a matter of how long will those negotiations draw out afterwards until they either come to an agreement or don't. Yeah. Uh, I think ideally, if you're the ACC, you, you might want to consider coming to an agreement because sovereign immunity laws can be had in some states that can be rewritten and readopted to be an advantage of the universities in those states. And that might not be something you want to wait out and see what happens on whenever you could just collect your massive money bags now and ensure the stability of your conference in perpetuity. But that's just me. I don't know. It's a, it's a tough call. Um, what I do think is that the sec makes infinitely more sense but at the same time what makes sense is not what happens in college sports necessarily right now sometimes it does but sometimes it doesn't for example what absolutely did not make sense was when they picked ucla to go along with usc first huh. instead of instead of getting oregon or washington first that made no yeah. sense except for the fact that USC was like, you're going to bring our little brother with us or else we're not coming. Right. And Fox was like, fine. <laughs> and so now UCLA is getting paid twice as much as Oregon and Washington, even though that makes no sense. Right. So whether, whether they end up in the SEC or the big 10 is a coin flip, Yeah. right? You, you, you couldn't, you couldn't tell me and I couldn't tell you. So, um, Oh, man, there's there's just so much happening right now. I did want to give a brief mention and shout out the NIT championship game tonight was an absolute banger. Uh, so much, so many, so many runs, so many, so many fast breaks, so much, so much physical play. So it was back and forth, back and forth the whole night. And Indiana State had a seven point lead at the end, and then they choked it. And Seton Hall with uh, Shaheen Holloway, who led St. Peter's on that Elite Eight run a couple years ago, he won it. And it was it was a, it was an amazing game, and it was like a home game because it was in it was in Indianapolis for Indiana State. So yeah, it was it was incredible, man. I'm telling you, that was probably it was a much better NIT crowd than whenever they had it in Vegas recently. Yeah. That was that was terrible. Uh, I can't believe they had it like that, man. That was that was sad. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't usually watch the NIT, but when I have watched it, I know it's obviously the the consolation, if you will. But those guys are still playing for something. You still get the in most intense level of basketball you'll ever get because when you're out there, you have a lot on the line. So, yeah, I'm sure it was great. Um, yeah, congrats to them. All right, last thing from you real quickly, just going off my theme for the whole video. I know you're, uh, you're a closet A&M supporter, maybe not so closeted. Yeah. What is the uh, biggest change, most significant change that you've noticed so far with Elko over the previous staff? 
Uh, you mentioned how the not only the the coaches have been like low maintenance, but I was going to mention you you kind of referred to it, but you haven't given it this title. They're they're low maintenance but high volume. What do you mean by they're high con- volume? They're constantly they're speaking for the program. They're they're constantly promoting. They're constantly they're 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 not afraid to speak to the media. They're not afraid to put themselves out there. They're not afraid to to do whatever because this is a closed program where we keep tight lips and uh you know loose lips sink ships and we don't we don't want anything to get out we we don't want to, to give anybody any fuel yada 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 no we're here and we're we're going to make this program stand out as as someone who's going to connect at every single opportunity because every single every single post every single every single word that comes out of your mouth is a chance to win people over and it's, it's all, it's all promotion. It's all marketing. It's all advertisement. That's all college sports is every day, man. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's been amazing to see that. I mean, every coach is doing this. It's awesome. It's awesome. And, and the, co- and the A&M social media team is behind it too. They're giving these coaches platforms. Coaches are actually talking to us. It's such a crazy concept. So yeah, that's, that is absolutely true. And I get what you mean by high, high volume, man. That's been one of the best uh, changes for sure. Oh yeah, all right. So now that I've, we've we had the A and M piece, I didn't get to finish on SMU, so I'll give thirty seconds, which is simply to say, and this is also related to A and M. Just for I will advise you on your future hires. If you ever hear a story where one of your top donors met your met the coach that you're hi, that you hired on a golf course a few years ago, and he and he mentions how he really after he talked to that coach while golfing for four hours, that he really liked this coach and that he, he hoped that one day he'd be able to hire him. And then whenever you do hire that coach years later and they were the number one candidate from the first day of the search and they never actually legitimately considered anybody else, even though they interviewed other people, that should be a massive red flag unless that coach has won national championships plural. Uh, and you better believe that is what SMU did with Andy Enfields. And if you ever hear that about any Texas A&M coach, uh, be warned that is a bad sign. And I'm not making this up. That is literally what our top donor said at the press conference on Tuesday whenever they announced Andy Enfields. So just, just beware of that. And if you hear that, you should immediately set off all the alarm bells you ever heard. That's more. That should be more alarm bells than if the opposing fan base of the coach that you hired is saying, we don't want them. Maybe they're wrong. But if you ever hear your donor saying how I fell in love with them on the golf course four years ago, you know something's not right. Okay, just just I need you to be aware of that so you can have your alarm bells ready. Because I can't believe I'm having to explain to SMU fans how this is not a good sign. And there's the impassioned weekly speech by Max. Consider yourselves warned, Aggies. Max, thank you for your time tonight, man. You always bring a better national perspective than I can offer. You have a great night. Appreciate you, man. Cheers, man. Good luck. Later. Good stuff from Max as usual. All right, guys. It's been about an hour into the show, and I got to use the restroom. I'll be right back with the chat, and then we have Theo and a Longhorn waiting in the call room. So I'll be right back, guys. I sit down and the one chat that was drawn to my eyes was, sorry, I'm smoking meth and driving. Yeah, that would explain this. It all makes sense. Always had a theory that eventually the Southwest Conference would get recreated by a restructure of the college football into an actual league. New organization would reorganize conferences. Look, 
I really like the Southwest Conference. I like the regionality of it. I like the toxicity of it. But, man, I'm so happy with the, the, the home slate next year, the slate of teams we get to play on a yearly basis in the SEC. So many amazing matchups, especially now that Texas and OU are here. I'm so happy. But, yeah, man, that's always on the table. I feel like that will never go away because that's just the region and the history. This year, there's more than four with the transfer portal. I don't know what context it is. ACC sucks. ACC sucks. It swallows. ACC doesn't suck. It's mid. John Peroni says Clemson and FSU will be in the SEC in 2025. Josh Pate is pretty certain that FSU and Clemson will get out one way or another. Sounds like that's the case at this point. The only question is the amount of dollars and time. ACC has too much to lose if they lose the lawsuit. Yeah, I tend to believe it'll be further than 2025. Of course, I'm no expert, but it does feel like this thing has some more legs behind it before we get there. But maybe, you never know. Chris Beard eyeing the Arkansas job. Is that your version of, a, of an announcement without being able to actually say that it's happening? Do you have sources? Do you have sources in Chicago or are they out of Oklahoma from a radio show? I don't know. I think Buzz Williams should still be on the hot seat, not fire, but he's a championship soon. Okay. I respect it, but I disagree with both. I think the term progress, but you're concerned about other things and you're willing to give it a longer look. I think the championship or bust mindset is a little bit much for a program like A&M's basketball program. And I, of course, Theo's on waiting next and Theo will get into this too. A&M is not a team, a program that invests heavily enough into their basketball program to draw top talent on a yearly basis into the program right now. It's hard to expect a championship when you're not recruiting championship level players. I think you could expect a tournament run. I think a Sweet 16 visit should be on the table and might even be the expectation based on who you bring in next year to the team. I don't know if you guys saw the Anderson Garcia transfer portal news. It was a fake source, thank goodness. But I don't know about hot seat. I don't know about being a championship soon. I think it's a little bit strong. But I do agree that it shouldn't be considered like a cushy safe seat. I think we need to, we need to see more progress going forward. He bought himself some time with the way he closed out the year. It's just how it's just how I feel about it. But I respect your opinion, of course. Football and a beer sounds great as long as we're watching the Aggies battle and win. I'm good. That's my bottom line. This time of year, we're going to talk about all the bullshit. It's not just bullshit. It's real. But at the end of the day, I'm happy Saturdays in the fall watching my team play, watching the Aggies either suffer or come victorious. I think we're going to have some better days ahead. I think the SEC is the only logical conference for them to join. Yeah, it makes a lot more sense. Valid point about the problems of the Super League would be awesome, but so many obstacles to get that. How many blue chips did Michigan have last year? I don't know the number. But I'll say this, Max, uh, it is a fact that that was the least talented by that blue chip ratio matchup in a championship of the college football era. I mean, of the of the college football playoff era, that, that is. And I think it's a testament to continuity in your team, team chemistry, keeping your team together, having a veteran team. I think in the transfer portal era, that is going to be the key to winning at the highest level. It's that continuity, chemistry. Being able to keep your team together and build a veteran team. A&M has the veteran aspect going for it right now. But they do not have the continuity aspect. They do not have that chemistry aspect. Yet, that's something that can be built fast. But it might not. We have to see. That's part of the question going into next season. ACC ain't mid in basketball, though. They definitely are not. ESPN has the ultimate control of the ACC grant of rights. They do the contract and redo it. They can end it and do everything. But they won't because it's an absurdly good deal for them. Yeah. Can Bussy make an impact this year? I think he absolutely can and will make an impact. And I don't know if he's down to down starting on offense or defense. He could be. But he's definitely going to play on both sides of the ball. And by the end of the year, he might damn well be a starter. I expect him to get meaningful reps versus Notre Dame, Philip. I really do. All right. Theo, you're on with Drew. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, brother man. How are you? Not too bad, man. Not too bad. So if San Antonio were to get another professional sports team, who would it be? And what would the branding be of that team? You know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would like it to be. A, I, I really think that all sports teams should be in or all sports leagues should be looking at San Antonio. Right. Um, Texas is consistently growing. 
now would be the time to get in there, make inroads with not only home fans, but um, fans that will be coming as it develops and grows. Yeah. Um, I know you kind of <laughs> you're cracking a joke at that because I am currently playing uh, NHL 22 for Xbox One, <laughs> and I did create a um, 33 a 33rd team, and they are called the San Antonio Bandits, and they are silver, black, and white like the Spurs. That is beautiful, and I am not a hockey fan at all, but if San Antonio got a team, I would be all in. So whatever San Antonio gets, I'm all in. And my preference is a baseball team. NFL team would be great, but I feel like that would just eat my heart out and like just destroy my life if we got an NFL team. So baseball would be a little bit more chill and relaxed. So I'm leaning baseball, but you're right. I think San Antonio is a hot spot. I think the bridge between San Antonio and Austin is shrinking. That whole I-35 stretch has developed now. I feel like a new Braunfels team or like a San Marcos team is a possibility or maybe even just like the shirts, the outskirts of San Antonio going towards Austin. I think there's so much potential for a team there because an Austinite could make a 45-minute drive if they live on the right side of town and make it to games and be a season ticket holder. So yeah, it could make a ton of sense, but... Anyway, Theo, you have anything on your mind tonight, Aggie football or college football-wise? Um, not really a whole lot. I did get to go back and listen to uh, Bateman's um, press conference yesterday. Yes, sir. Something I found interesting about his press conferences is, is how he says he doesn't quite have one flaw, one complete philosophy for his defense. Um that he's adaptable and moldable to what he needs to fit for the team. And I guess that makes sense considering what he did at Army in the aspect that he um, was able to turn them into one of the best defenses in the country. And then watching him work at um, what he could limitedly do at North Carolina, um, where he was able to develop some really good pass rushers there at North Carolina um, that ended up making it to, to the league. Um, so I'm looking forward to see how he molds this defense. And I found it interesting how um, Hicks kind of let it out that they're going to be running more of a 4-3 defense um, or more of a four-man front yeah, than a three-man front like Lester. I think he just mentioned the four. Yeah, that's right. So I guess I, this is, I'm looking forward to what's going to happen with spring ball and stuff like that. Yeah, and to me, it, it kind of all comes together with everything that you've mentioned and I've mentioned that he's willing, obviously, to adapt to his personnel. I think when you're adapting to the personnel at Texas A&M over the last few years, you're building from that defensive line out. It, it just makes sense to me. It makes sense that you would lean on that position group. And, of course, you have promising pieces everywhere. But we know that A&M can hit you with waves of very talented and now experienced veteran players at the defensive line. So you could probably speak more on this than I can. With the three-man fronts we saw over the last couple of years, I have no problem with a three-man front. But to me at Texas A&M in particular, this is a program that recruits by far the best of all positions at the defensive line. It's been that way for a little while now. It was especially that way in 2022. It was a little weird to me to see them go away from that, at least in a small capacity. And I know you had that stand-up edge guy out there, whether it was LT Overton or Malik Silla, and they were occupying a zone. But a lot of times those guys were dropping back far in coverage, and it was just – it didn't feel like it was playing to the strengths of your defense. And I, I think that was maybe a place where I think scheme got a little bit – kind of trumped common sense in my opinion. That, that's just my opinion. What do you think about that? Well, I think – I think more than anything, injuries played a role in that. Um, and I know people are going to be like, oh, the injury list is such an excuse. But um, Durkin's first year, we only had like six defensive linemen for the no, first you're, like you're right four or five that. games. You're right about that first half of that first year. And I purposely have not been leaning on that too much. So, I mean, by, by definition, that kind of had to happen by default. Um, and that was a really good secondary. As, a great secondary. Yes. Um, but even at that, you know, the next year there was still periods of time where we were down guys, especially the bigger one techs. Um, there was times when we were down to just McKinley Jackson, or there was times when we were down to 
um, just as backup. So it's hard to have, especially in the SEC, um, it's hard to have like only four or five interior defense alignment. Even if you can pull your defensive ends, which we had bigger defensive ends that we could do that with, it's still not the same impact in stopping the run and um, maintaining the, the gaps and gap integrity that you would normally have to have on a four-man defensive front. Because when you run a 4-2, your defensive ends really have to be more like your outside linebackers and keep your running game contained. If they get outside of there, it's going to take your outside linebacker and or your safety who may be already dropping in some sort of coverage of cover three, cover two, cover four, whatever you're playing, um, and belling out of that spot to come back up and, and get that outside run. And that's why we gave up a lot of outside runs because our defenders were not used to doing that. Um, and I think that's why they went to more of a, a three four look last year where they had that stand up guy and then that stand up guy would bail because it was able to keep the um run boxed while also keeping your younger <coughs> defensive line um fresher and able to rotate them more. Um I didn't like it. I'm I'm a four three guy with variations of a 4-2 and variations of maybe a 3-3 every once in a while. Mm -hmm. If you face a passing team, like, as a switch up, when you yeah, face nice a passing team. Yeah, it'd be be multiple on defense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, I'll but, say this real quick on what you just said. Did we ever run a 3-4? I felt like at most it would be a 3-3. It was never really a 3-4. I don't think we ever brought in that – Fifth, that third end or that third linebacker. I think it was mostly a 3-4. Unless you want to call maybe a nickel at the line of scrimmage that, that other hybrid linebacker, which that, that did well, happen. Well, there, 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 there was a handful of times. Uh, I think I can remember it against the Auburn game because Auburn was run heavy. Yep. I can remember it sometimes during the Alabama game because Alabama went back run heavy but then obviously just dropped back and torched us. Mm -hmm. Um. I remember the Tennessee game at some point. They did bring in the third linebacker and then had Silla or whoever on the outside. In practice, no, in theory, everything you explained about why you would do it made sense. But in practice, I don't think it ever looked very consistent or solid. I think a lot of times it wasn't. The, the, the guy that was dropping back in coverage looked uncomfortable is what it felt like. It didn't seem very like, much so. It never felt solid. So that's why I just like that it seems like Bateman's ready to just play to his player's strengths. Just that basic philosophy alone. It's just a nugget we got. And that's exciting to me. That's what excites me about this linebacker crew, honestly, is because I can actually see us running some 3 4 with this linebacker crew. For sure. Uh, a lot of people in there. You can see, like, you know, Ryan Kennedy being a stand-up outside linebacker and running off the edge. I can see um, the kid from St. John Bosco, who, who's slipping my head right now. I can see him playing an outside linebacker because he knows how to drop and get it to depth and is comfortable doing that. Yeah. Scylla and them were not comfortable doing that. So right. that's why Scylla would be in the right place or in vicinity to make a play on the ball but couldn't make a play on ball because he wasn't comfortable doing that. Absolutely. The guys we have now would be more comfortable doing that. But I also love the fact that we actually have, I feel like we have more one text this year than we've had in recent memory. Um, outside of maybe the Jordan, the, the PV, um, PV Brown, and the kid from Gladewater years when we when we had those three guys on the roster at the same time that was probably the biggest the interior D line we've had at the time. So who are the one techs going to be this year? Um, Big Samu, he's going to be there. I hope he gets. Yeah, I hope he's productive this year. He's, he seems like a lot. His body's really matured. I don't know how much of it is going to be more. Pro, pro, 
it depends on what he's asked to do as a defensive tackle or the one tech and a nose. Yep. If he's if he's asked to get up the field and, and make a pass rush and stuff like that, I I don't see that production being there. Um but he is a big boy. Um you got Samu, you still got the kid coming back from last year that sat behind mm-hmm. Kenley Jackson. I thought Regis. Eh. Regis. And based off of what we saw in the bowl game, Dindy looked good at the one ten. I know, but I'm I'm I, I, I don't want to make a, a too big of a statement here, I have to be careful. I'm getting a little nervous about Dindy and his health, man. I'm getting a little nervous. He's missing spring, or at least so far. I don't think he's practiced yet. I want to get a good update on Dindy. But, yes, he, sh- he was very promising in the bowl game. His body absolutely fixed, fits the mold. But, yeah, yeah, I, I wonder who's starting. I wonder who's the starting one tech. Is it going to be Regis? And how do we feel about that? I think it's a good thing. I think Regis starting in the one tech is a good experienced guy to put out there. And then I think Samu, I believe- Samu situationally. I believe Regis deserves it. He's yeah. been here four years. He's stepped behind Kim Jackson. He had the opportunity to transfer this year. He decided not to. Sure. He could have easily went with Coach Rob up to Syracuse. For sure. They would have loved him up there, and he's from that area. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, why not reward the kid who, who deserves it? Now, that having said that, I still would like to see him produce. You know, yeah. and when I say produce at the one tech, I need to see him hold up the offensive line. Yeah. Don't let the offensive line get up to the second level. Eat a double team. Yep. Force the double team. Yeah. Don't just eat the double team, but force it. Make sure that they cannot get up to the second level. That way, our linebackers that are young, but developing and fast and intellectual, can read the holes and get there. Um. But, yeah, it's just going to be really interesting, interesting to see that. Um, Samu, of course, is going to help supplement that. Dindy will supplement that. Um, I'm sure there's times when, you know, it's it's a third and seven, third and 12, third and 16. You know, you may see, like, a Hicks in there at the one tick and then have um, – Turner next not to one. Turner or someone else next to to him at the three and then two other defensive ends that are more like your designated pass rushers yeah um i i, I need to see some of these one techs i mean I, I i feel good about them i need to see samu first i need to see dindy first of all stay healthy and play on a consistent basis i do feel like dj hicks is becoming more and more of a sure thing as time goes on from what we hear but what I am very, very confident in is this defensive line's ability to pass rush on third down, whatever configuration they throw out there. I feel like Ooh. that is going to be one of the most fun parts of this entire football team next year. Not just that, but the speed we have at the linebacker positions and sure. the safety positions to bring – And versatility, yeah. Bring it from anywhere and everywhere. We can we can go ahead and drop all, you know, all seven of the, the back seven if we wanted to. Or we can bring someone to go along with the defensive line and just be, uh, man, it just it takes me back to, it takes me back to the the Orange Bowl year where we just, Elko That's was money, yeah, in the second half and and would just make adjustments and he would call the blitz at the right time and it just, yep. something we miss. There's some serious potential with this defense, man. All right, going back onto my theme, I think you already alluded to one thing, but what would be one of the changes you've noticed with this program early in the Elko days as opposed to last year, aside from the four de- four-man front nugget we got this week? What, what's one of your most welcome changes so far or something you want to see? Um, something I want to see is the continued recruiting development. Um. You remember in the beginning, I was really kind of worried, not that he could, couldn't could find players, but he wouldn't be able to compete for the upper level of players. Yeah. And I don't know if you just saw, because um, you probably started the show before I sent it to you, but um, I believe it's Anthony Williams, the 2025, like, number one linebacker in Texas or something like that. Mm-hmm. He decommitted from Texas. 
and he had really good ties with Elko and stuff before he committed to Texas. Oh, nice. Yeah, so the, the, the connections there are like hinting that he could be here. That'd be a huge um, chess piece. And addition just to flip him. Yeah, yeah. To flip him from Texas. That would be, huge. would be amazing. Um, the kids uh, from Louisiana, the brothers that we're, we're trying to chase down and, and get. And then all that. So I want us to continue to do that. I want to continue to see that because we already we got that big, huge piece in the links. Mm-hmm. I really like I really like that kid. Um, I think he could become a future one tech myself. Sure. He, he he has the frame for it, even though he plays three tech at the moment. His body um, is advanced for his years, man. You don't see a lot of two eighty six twos as a junior. I mean, he looks great and with his explosiveness and his. His drive. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, that's what I want to see continue. Yeah. Now, what I've seen continued, or what I've seen that's been a change from the past, is we all know that Jimbo made connections with certain players, I feel yeah. like. Yeah. It kind of feels like this program has developed connections with all the players. Everyone that's came into Tex Eggs, like Wigman, Hicks, um, Shamar Stewart, Shamar Stewart, yeah. even Anias, when he, yeah, he, Scorton, Anias, everyone that comes in there has talked about two things discipline mm-hmm. and um, connections. That Elko has developed big, big connections. And he's big on making connections with these kids and these guys. And um, I think that's going to pay off in the long run because going back to what you talked about in terms of the transfer portal and the senior classes and and the bigger classes and us having to be um, led by experience, you get that experience by developing connections. And then when these guys end up in the transfer portal, they'll be like, oh, yeah, this coach was really good to me when I was recruited by him. Yeah, sure. And he's still good to me now. So let's him come in. I, I feel like that's a big reason why we got Scorton. Yeah, absolutely. So, In addition to uh, that, I think that relationship, player and coach, I think that extends player to player, position group to position group based on what we've heard about them making players, I mean, making them, but having players sit with other position groups at lunches or in meetings or whatever it is. And I think other position group coaches are interacting with other position group players and just forming that unity across the field, across the board. I think it just compounds on itself. So very much in agreement with you there. That's, that's been a huge, awesome thing that we've learned about this team. Mm-hmm. Um, now adversity is going to test that sure. when we get in there and, and we get to our first, you know, say we end up down 10, nothing versus Notre Dame in the first quarter or something or seven, nothing after the first quarter, you know, how's this team going to respond to that? That that's, we're going to have to find that out. And it all sounds good and dandy now, but once adversity hits, we'll have to find out how they respond. And if they stay close knitted and stay on this, brotherhood type thing mm-hmm. um and some of the best teams i've ever been a part of and and coached and talked to and been around um it was every bit of that brotherhood mold you know it's not so much fighting for that extra yard just for me but knowing that my brothers needed me to do it yep it, it's a huge motivator motivator when it when it comes down to adversity Exactly. They're trying to program that in now so it's consistent and always there even when those punches get thrown your way. Well, all right, Theo. Anything else from you tonight or are we going to call it a night? Uh, that's up to you, my guy. I'm, I'm off to bed as soon as we're done. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get Works to my last call. calling me tomorrow. Oh, man. Early morning? Always. Yep, yep. Well, all right, Theo. I appreciate you 6:30 jumping 6.30 every morning. That's that's life. No man. problem, that's buddy. Life. Well, good good luck tomorrow, and thanks for jumping on. Talk to you soon. You too. Have a good one, Drew. All right, that was Theo.
Philip says, my fear is some of these guys who don't make the rotation jump in the portal. Maybe I'm just paranoid. That's always the fear today, man. You're, you're right in that fear. But I don't think you should think that that fear is unique to A&M ever. That's just the thing that happens everywhere now in college football. Tyler, good to see you, man. Dindy and Eni White missing spring is frustrating. Yeah. Those are guys that really needed more reps because I feel like those are guys that are poised to like turn the page and, and, and make a name for themselves next year. They said Dindy has a chance to come back second half of spring. The word he used for Eni was very, very limited. I, that probably means not, not practicing. But Dindy could come back. Hopefully he does. 979 hard hitters. Good to see you, man. All right. Last caller of the night. Chirac Horn. Chirac Horn. That's Chicago Longhorn. What's going on, Chicago Longhorn? What's up? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. What's going on? I have a question for you, Chicago Longhorn. Let me hear it. All right. So Jeff Swaim, he's a, a radio host. In Oklahoma, I think he's Oklahoma State affiliate or supporter or whatever. He says that he has a, 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 a source in Chicago that is nails that claims that A&M is actively trying to get to the Big Ten. Are you that source? Well, even if I was, I couldn't tell you that I was. So uh, I, I'm going to say no to that. Okay, so that means he's the source. So this is the source for all the Big Ten rumors out of Chicago, the mystery source. It's Chirac Horn. Well, what's on your mind tonight, Chirac Horn? Uh, not much. Hey, guys, how are y'all? Thanks for tuning in to listen to me speak to Drew Tam Yu. Um, I, have a, I have a couple questions for Drew about Aggie football and a couple more big-picture life questions uh, to hit you with. But uh, I'll just jump into the Aggie football question first. Um, I'm a big Longhorn fan, right? Uh, very happy with what Sark's doing. Uh, but I do think Mike Elko is a sneaky good hire for A&M, and I like a lot of the stuff he's doing. Um, I want to hear from you. This is like a two-part question, kind of unrelated, but devil's advocate, what are some things that you aren't thrilled about with Mike Elko, maybe staff, personnel? Uh, I know it's so early to say. Is there anything that's like a potential red flag for you? And also, the uh, Aggie linebacker room, I'm curious about, because I know Edge Cooper's gone now, and I feel like that could be a potential hole. I like y'all's D-line. I like y'all's secondary. Uh, but the linebacker room, similar to Texas kind of this year, uh, I feel like – or Texas with the defensive tackle situation, I feel like that could be y'all's biggest hole. So let me, let me hear your opinion on the uh, LBs. Okay, so I'll start with Elko in Red Flags, and that is – so the reason that I drop a caveat every time I speak highly of the staff that you have to go freaking win games is because everything has been very positive so far. I mean, in this time of year, it's the 100-0 season. Everybody's undefeated. Everybody has a chance to win it all. We have a new outlook. We have a new coaching staff. I'm trying to go through things, and it might take me some time to think of like what I don't like and what's a red flag because everything is glass half full right now. We don't have full context yet. I mean, we don't know what the results are, so it's really hard to say. But like I said at the beginning of this, of this video, every change coming off of 7 and 5 and 5 and 7 is a welcome change. So you feel good about everything initially. So it's, I mean, it feels like such a weak move to say nothing yet. No red flags yet. Maybe the chat can help. What are some re Elko red flags? Oh, man. I don't even know. What's a red flag about Mike Elko? Is he too nice? He's nice. Is he too nice? I don't think so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save that. I'm talk about the linebackers first. Okay, so yes, you lose Edge Cooper, but you bring back your play caller and your Basically, your team captain on defense, Torian York, he's the other linebacker next to next to Edge Cooper. I think he allowed Edge Cooper to be Edge Cooper. He allowed Edge Cooper just to go play, pin his ears back, and just play football. He took care of all the play calls, the leadership stuff, the the shifts on the defensive line, whatever it was. Torian York was doing it. He's like a teacher's pet kind of a guy, very much a leader for this team. I think it's huge to have him back. But I worry if he is maybe not what he could be without a guy like Edge Cooper next to him. I do have a slight worry about the first year of this linebacker group being next year because you got a lot of new guys there that aren't Edger and Cooper. 
but I feel really good about the future of this room. So I think Alex Howard is a contender to start next year. He's a fifth year senior out of Youngstown State, has a ton of college football experience, 6'2, 235. He seems like the kind of guy that kind of bust onto the scene and be a really good player. The guy that he was mentioning earlier, that Theo was mentioning earlier, was um, blinking on the name Jordan Lockhart. He's a freshman who is coming in, maybe underrated three star, looked very promising in his senior bowl. Tristan Jernigan's another really promising freshman that's in the room now. Scooby Williams was a starter at Florida who Jay Bateman said needed a change of scenery. He was highly touted coming out of high school. He's a guy with potential. You have a lot of guys with potential. You have Rylan Kennedy. You have Damian Sanford. You have Chance Johnson. You have a bunch of guys. You have Martrell Harris, who I thought was a guy who would have had a role last year, but he ended up not having a role because Chris Russell, the senior, ended up being the guy who would just take all those bench minutes. I'm very confident about this room as a whole going forward, but I will say that's a question mark for me going into next year is who is that guy that steps right into the, into the shoes of Edron Cooper as a starter? So that's a very good question mark. That's a very good question mark for this team as a Longhorn that you have. Guys, red flag. I don't think I have one for Elko yet. Everything has been really positive. I've really liked what he's done so far. But that is a whole different question to ask me once we've seen this team play a couple weeks. So I'm going to say no red flags yet. And you can take that to your Longhorn trolls and troll me with that if you want. No red <laughs> flags with Mike Elko yet. Yeah, I was trying to think of one myself, and I really couldn't. I just think... I'm trying to figure out who Elko is. Is he a um, like a CEO? Is he a rah rah coach? Is he a players coach? So uh, I'm interested to see his year one. I think that Notre Dame game will be awesome. I think y'all are going to get game day. I hope for that. so. I hope so. The other candidate would be LSU USC, right? And that's neutral site on Sunday, so I don't think that gets it. And, and then Georgia Clemson is also neutral site. That is on Saturday. Maybe that gets it. But I think yeah. I think there's a chance A&M starts out like ranked 24, 25, and Notre Dame's a top 10 team. I think they'll want to go to Aggieland and Elko's first game, Notre Dame with – I mean, okay, so there's an interesting thing about Notre Dame. Riley Leonard is injured. He's not practicing in spring. He's having a second surgery on a previous surgery to adjust, I think, a metal plate or something that was put into his ankle. So Riley Leonard's status is in jeopardy, or at least his percentage of whatever health he's at is in jeopardy for week one. So that's an interesting other storyline that I haven't mentioned with the Aggies yet. Um, did I not say Youngstown State, Child Tyler? Did I say it wrong? I don't know what I said. Anyway, okay, yeah, I think it's I think it's promising. I think it was very promising. What else you got? All right, this is a little more off topic, but it's relevant to the beautiful area of San Antonio, Central Texas. Um, land of Wembenyama, yes. Yes, the best city in Texas. And actually, the question was about Wemby. Um, I want you to sell me... Um, I've heard a lot of people say that Chet Holmgren is a better rookie than Wemby and uh, that Wemby is overhyped and won't be the GOAT. But with my two eyes, I think Wemby could be better than Michael Jordan. Um, almost got a quadruple double the other day against Jokic, uh, which is crazy at 20. And then another question. So I want you to talk about Wemby, uh, your thoughts on him as a Spur and the future of the Spurs. And the last question I'll have, then you can get out of here, is uh, I loved your Torchies Fuego rant. I agree, Fuego is so much better than Torchies. And this is coming from a Longhorn. But uh, I want to know about the uh, best brisket. What's the best brisket? <laughs> the best brisket in San Antonio. <laughs> and uh, that's it. <laughs> oh, that's, okay. These, we're all over the place here. Okay. <laughs> best brisket in San Antonio. It's two places. It's two places. When you're talking about brisket in San Antonio, you're talking about the 2M Smokehouse on the southeast side of town. A little bit of a Mexican flair to the brisket. A little bit more snap to that bark. A little crispier outside, but just such a good, flavorful brisket. They have their own home blend diet soda that's so clutch. And they have the greatest mac and cheese of any barbecue mac and cheese place I've been to. It's Chicharron Mac and Cheese. So good. You're also talking about Pinkertons. That's a classic Texas-style brisket, salt and pepper, cooked to perfection. If you just want a classic brisket, you're going to Pinkertons. But I will say I like the 2M sauce a little bit more. It's a little bit more of a molasses-style sauce, not tomato-based. I'm really about it, and I'm really about the Mexican flair being the whatever percentage of Mexican man that I am growing up in a Mexican whatever percentage household. I like that. It speaks to me. So I'm leaning 2M. Good beans, good diet soda. It's 2M Smokehouse, guys. Look it up. Only open Thursday through Sunday. Not a sponsor. 
But Pinkertons, you can't go wrong either. And that's just classic. On to Wemby. I mean, you just threw so much at me. I don't know if anybody here in the chat cares about Victor Wimbanyama or the Spurs so quickly. I think, I mean, I think it's so obvious that Wemby is just a better player than Chet Holmgren. I think Chet's a great player. I think he can be a Hall of Fame type player. But you're talking about another level of potential with Victor Wimbanyama. <laughs> I can't believe I'm talking about this on an AM YouTube show right now. The skill set at his size, he's an offensive hub. You can run an entire offense through, through Victor Wimbanyama. He's obviously an anchor plus, plus, plus on defense. He's already a top, he's probably already the best defensive player in the league at 20 years old. And people that detract from him are always the, the few detractors I've heard, and they're, they're becoming fewer and farther between these days. But some of the detractors, what I've heard so far is, oh, well, he's not doing what Kareem did as a rookie. I don't know why we're thinking this guy's on GOAT status. Buddy, Kareem was 23 years old as a rookie. Victor Wimanyama started the rookie year at 19 years old, and he's doing what he's doing right now. It's insane how much better he's gotten in one year and at what age he's doing it at and the team he has around him. I'm not going to knock on the Spurs. I think there are some good young players on that team, but the average age of that rotation is 22 years old or something like that. That is a young-ass professional sports team. And for Victor to be as good as he is with that team around him, I mean, just imagine if that team stays together and adds like a Trey Young in four years, it's going to be a damn amazing basketball team. So I hope I answered your question. I don't know. I mean, there are detra- you, you went from like, what do you see to people? What do you say to people that are detracting from Wemby and saying he's not going to be the GOAT? I think the fact that you just said that speaks to what people think about Victor Wembanyama. We're talking about whether a 20 year old is going to be the GOAT of a sport or not. That's freaking insane. And you're not the only one to talk about him like that. It's insane. We're so lucky. We're so lucky we got David Robinson, Tim Duncan, and Victor Wimanyama. We're so spoiled. We just need to go, you know, start winning some games in the future, though. Anyway, back to the chat and off of Victor Wimanyama. Do you have anything else for me, Chirac Horn? That was, you got me all over the place here. I don't know if these Aggies are falling asleep listening to me rant about brisket and Wimby. No, man. I just wanted to keep you on your toes, keep the chat on the toes. It's, it's the off season, so this is when I get these questions in. Um, but I just did the math and it's 142 days till week zero. So, uh, we're getting there, but luckily A&M baseball is really good this year. So that'll carry y'all till June. I don't know about Texas. We usually get hot late, but we might be really bad this year, but yeah. hopefully it flies by. I'll take the, I could take this opportunity to dog on you and how we beat y'all a couple of weeks ago and how y'all maybe aren't having the best year, but it really is about who's hot late. And the thing I said about this team after we dropped the series to Florida was, We know we have a good baseball team. We also know that this is a really good conference of baseball teams. And we also know that no one's ever going undefeated or winning all these games. So lose your games, but just continue to improve and peak at the right time. Peak at the end of the year. Stay steady. Don't let yourself get down with losses. I was impressed with this Tuesday win versus Texas State. I wish I could have gone to it. But yeah, it's really helping the offseason go by as being good at so good at baseball. It's been awesome and also Wimby. But all right, Shirak Horn, I appreciate you with the off the wall questions, man. You have a good night. You too. That was interesting, and I appreciate it. Philip Mixon says Scooby Williams, Rylan Kennedy, the kid from Jacksonville State, and the kid from Woodlands, Harris. We got plenty of linebackers. We have a ton of them, but I just I need to know like who is playing at a high level, an SEC level next year. Because I feel like Whoever it is, if it's not Alex Howard or Scooby or whoever, they don't have they lack experience or they're they're jumping up in competition, Youngstown State to AM, or they had a down year, it's Scooby Williams coming from Florida A and M, or they're an unproven guy. So to me it's a major question mark, but like I'll keep saying, I'm very confident in the room going forward. I think by mid year we'll feel good about it. But the thing that I'll continue to say throughout this offseason is is you don't really have time to get better with the schedule this year because you play four, you play Notre Dame to start the year, obviously. You're traveling to the Swamp in week three. You're playing Arkansas. You're playing Missouri. It's an SEC slate plus Notre Dame opener. So you don't have a lot of time, and that's that's the caveat. That's that's kind of the, the cloud above everything that kind of influences everything you say about this team. I think getting Florida's two front seven coaches is a possible red flag. That's a good point. That defense was atrocious. That's a fair, fair point, Tyler. We can That's, that's a good one. I think – People have good things to say about Jay Bateman and um, Spence, but it didn't work at Florida. So that's a really good point. Yeah, that, that if you're going to be nitpicky, that's a really good red flag, Tyler. 
Better than Michael Jordan? Come on. Yeah, it's an insane prediction to throw out there right now. He's 20 years old. It's insane. But some people are talking about him like that. It's, it's, that's, I mean, yeah, it's insane, right? It, it's freaking crazy. But it's a testament to what his potential is. I'm not saying he's going to do it, but the fact that people are saying this crazy shit is just – we don't it, – it's, it's beyond belief when you watch him play, honestly. It's crazy to watch such a young dude with the skill set and the drive and the mentality that he has. It's, it's weird. It's hard to process. Cassius Howell transfer from Bowling Green is a great ad. Yes. You think he'll play some linebacker? He might play. He might rat, st- stand up a little bit. I'm super high on Cassius Howell. He's one of my unexpected guys next year, one of my breakout guys. I was correcting Phillip. Okay, got you. Alex Howard from Youngstown. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what happened. I got you. Yeah, I think Alex Howard should be the favorite. I, I think Scooby has a chance to improve here, but I think Alex Howard should be the guy. I was disappointed with the Foster State and track. Yeah, Philip, that was pretty disappointing. I mean, not really for us, for him. I felt like if he wanted that NFL future, he needed every rep he could get right now. But for him, speaking on, speaking for and to Bryce Foster, I'm happy for him doing what he wants to do, doing what he feels is best for his athletic endeavors. Good for him. More power to him. I do appreciate that he's at least attending the some the practices that he can attend. I don't know if you saw Philip. He's been at practices with his notepad, taking in the, the, the new offense and learning and everything. But they're shuffling guys around this offensive line. That 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 center position might get occupied. I'm really excited to see what um, – I'm blinking on names as usual. They're moving guys around. There's a new center. I mentioned him earlier in the game in the, in the show tonight. It's getting late. Bill Millers gets my vote for best brisket in San Antonio. Roley, I, I need to put you in timeout for that. Guys, I am a Bill Millers hater. I'll put it at that. Not a fan. Not a fan. All right, guys. What a great show tonight. We had 30 viewers right now. That's great for an off-season show for a channel of my size. If you guys could do me a huge favor, if you're not subscribed, do that. But tell one person about this show. We're going to keep doing this live show every week that I can throughout this off-season. And this week I didn't put out a video because I have I had a crazy work schedule this week. It was insane. So this is the best I could do this week. But I do have a video planned next week. Maybe some clips, maybe some other stuff, but for sure a video and a live show next week. Tell a friend about the show. Tell an Aggie about it. We want to bring more guys into this, so by the time we get to the regular season, we have a great collection of guys. I hope we bring other fan bases in here, and people are talking shit, and it's a bloodbath in the chat. I love that. It's college football at its best. You guys who are here tonight, you guys are awesome. Thanks to everybody that called in. Max, Theo, Shirak, Horn. Longhorn's calling in. I love it. Bring it on. Guys, y'all are awesome. Thanks for being here, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Gig'em. Gig'em as usual.